Um, <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, how it, it's, we don't make a lot of changes to config for the most part. Um, the config on the, on the Vagrant box here um, is pretty much what we've already developed for our production and staging systems. And so it's more rolling down that direction. Um, we, you know, it's, it's, we've been doing a lot because up until recently we didn't have any sort of standardization on what our production environment looked like. So as we standardize the production environment, this project actually came out of that standardization into we're also standardizing the development environment to match the production environment. Um, so that's, that's kind of where that stands. So you had a question there? Yeah. Um, currently I'm developing with NAMP, and mm -hmm. I guess what's nice about it is that it's your MySQL management. It's always there and on, and you can just take data mm -hmm. from that affidavit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you constantly uh, MySQL dumping and, and putting stuff in, or is there an easier way to handle the database um, locally? It depends on the project. Um, so the question was, uh, you know, how do you handle databases in the virtual machine um, for the camera? Uh, it depends on the project. Um, we do a lot of Drupal work. Um, so with Drupal, um, Drush, the, the command line management tool for Drupal, has a very good database sync tool. So you can basically say Drush SQL sync from your staging or prod system that pulls the current copy of the database down into your local environment. Um, it'll also push the other direction if you want to. Um, that's kind of our preferred method of working. Um, and in fact, it works well enough that our front end developers, um, so our, our themers, are actually using the same environment. Um, we've got them up on Git, and we've got them doing this, so we actually have them pull down this when they pull down the repo when they're working on the themes. And they are going through, they're doing the SQL sync um, and the file sync, and then um, they're up and running. And that's, that's actually one of the things that really pleased me about the way this worked, is how well our non-developers, our non-coders, are actually able to use this tool as well. Um, so, Evan, you, had, uh, you, you talked about using the Puppet... Um, yeah, uh, so we're using a, uh, I think the Puppet Labs MySQL module, and it has support for some automated database backups. Um, so that's one of our pending issues, is to make this automatically take backups every few minutes right out of SQL file. And then if you vagrant destroy, you still have the, the backed up SQL file. Uh, and as Greg said, in our workflow, we usually have a persistent real server that we sync databases to. And so we really treat the database inside the vagrant box as temporary. It's just, it's too easy to destroy it to try to rely on it. Yeah. Um, so let's say instead of trying to test your code chains, you're trying to test the puppet chains, where there's a puppet mm -hmm. server that's offering a specific version. Um, is there a, a way to do something like that? I, ha I don't have, I've been working on a test bed for our puppet server and agent, puppet master and puppet agent setup. Uh, and I don't have that working. Uh, for this project, what we did was we wrote a bunch of shell scripts at first, months ago, and then I translated them into, pu into Puppet rules. Uh, and I used the, I just did vagrant precision 100 times each day until I got it straightened out. <laughs> Well, you turn on the debug uh, statements and turn off the log destination options. It's in the vagrant file. Then you'll see all the output on the on your console, and uh, Puppet will complain about lots of things. And sometimes, sometimes the stare messages are difficult to decipher. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. But yeah. See. Oh, let me get the Puppet run. Oops. Did you have a question? I haven't read the book, <laughs> so. Uh, the new yeah, there's not much in there you can see. So there, there's a caveat with, with Vagrant is that we're using the 1.0 branch, which is the virtual box only. Uh, and we tried to upgrade to the 1.1 branch in the middle of a, a release deadline, so we, we moved right back to 1.0 because yeah. something broke. Um, so I, I don't know much about 1.1. And the new docs are all written for 1.1. Some of the names have changed. So there's two sets of docs for Vagrant out there. They're, they're a little different. Yeah. 
Yeah. The news docs are look better and are like are phrased a little better, I think, but sometimes they don't work for the 1.0 branch. I did at least using this code on Vagrant 1.1 get it to boot. Oh, that's um, good. It threw some errors at me, but it did boot. Um, it needs some cleanup, but it, it's a, it's not an insurmountable project. It, it it is actually something that's doable, and it's on the roadmap. We just haven't gotten there yet. And I was going to show you the logs because actually, with the way we configured this particular vagrant, there's actually only a couple of there's a there's a puppet right there, but. Um, Actually, since, it, since it's current, it didn't actually throw anything. But um, right now, we're redirecting the Vagrant um, and Puppet log entries into syslog. So it's going to show in here, and it'll throw errors. Also, um, let me see if it shows on here. Whoops. When I booted it. Ah, that's OK. Uh, well, here. We'll force it. It'll, um, the other thing is, when it's booting, it'll show errors on the console as it's booting. So you'll actually see. So if you've screwed up your puppet configs, it'll throw errors here, and they'll show in red. Um, so it'll be pretty obvious that, oh, you've got a problem, and you need to fix it. Um, we saw quite a few of those. I actually suppressed a whole bunch of this stuff because it was spewing. But puppet can be verbose. <laughs> uh, so you have to be a little careful about that. To follow up on your MySQL question, uh, you'll see I'm forwarding the MySQL port there, uh, and it's easy to write a, uh, a puppet rule to configure the MySQL daemon to listen on all, all interfaces, and then you can run something like MySQL or PHP MyAdmin or MySQL admin tools on your local machine and point it to that server, and then access the database server from there if you need that kind of access. So the question was, how open is Puppet? Um, Puppet is very open. Um, I think that they're, they're one of the companies that really gets open source. Um, yeah, they have their enterprise version that has a bunch of bells and whistles that, they upsell you, they, that they'll upsell you to. Um, I've been running this sort of stuff for a while now, um, and yeah, I have yet to get a call from anybody at Puppet saying, here, you want to buy something? Now, Puppet is, is wide open there. They're a good company to work with. Um, and if you don't like Puppet, fine, do it in Chef. <laughs> you know, there are other tools out there to do it. You don't have to use Puppet. Um, and Chef and Puppet are both well supported within Vagrant. Um, y it, it, they actually directly use, say, I want to use Puppet and tell it where to find the Puppet manifest, and it just does it. You can do the same thing with Chef. Yeah, so the question was, uh, running Vagrant in production? Not really, no. Vagrant's really designed for disposable machines for development. Um, it's, it's not a replacement for a true virtualization management system. Um, so yeah, it, it, uh, it works well for temporary b machines that you're expecting to blow up. Yeah, like like Evan's using Vagrant for you know testing, or building out our, our puppet production puppet systems. I mean, you know, if, I did it when I was testing out. Um, we were doing a large site that had you know multiple nodes in a, and varnish on the front end, and so I built it out entirely in Vagrant first, tested everything, made sure that that whole multi-node multi-node system worked the way it was expecting to. So it, yeah, we're only this this is only really a very small edge case for what what Vagrant is capable of doing. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the let me go back to the tree real quick here. Um, yeah. Really, the only mandatory piece is that vagrant file, um, and so which is the reason we and, and it needs to be in the root, and which is why we we kind of structured the tree this way is that. You plop the vagrant file on the root, you create the HT docs, you mount, and then you tell vagrant to mount the HT docs. Everything you need is all there in that repo, um, which is, again, trying to streamline that flow so our devs aren't fighting with, with configuration. I'm going to 
So just to touch a couple of things. Um, to get, especially to get the DevOps side in here, you are all using staging and test servers before you push to production, right? Right? <laughs> OK, just making sure, because uh, yeah, the best way to shoot yourself in the foot is push uh, dev code to a prod server and then realize, oops, probably shouldn't have done that. Um, so, you know, and, and this is where the DevOps really comes into play, is that, so you're doing all your development in Vagrant, you, you checked the entire project into Git, when you're ready to go to staging to maybe um, either do code, peer review code, or you know, review with the clients to say, hey, look, we built your thing, take a look at it. You literally pull on, it, it's on, the, on the staging server and point the vhost at the HD doc directory inside the, uh, inside the repo, and you're done. I mean, that's the whole point, is to get all this crap out of the way so that when you're actually ready to go to deployment, the code you have in your repo is ready to be deployed immediately. And then, of course, the same thing on production. And then, of course, everybody wins, right? You're in production, you're done. Um, so that's there. Pull requests are eagerly welcomed. <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of stuff in there that I did originally, which was not the best way to do it. Evan's done a good job of cleaning up my messes. Um, but you know, especially I, I know a lot of you folks in here are, are much more um, talented at Puppet than I am. Um, I would love to get more stuff from you all on this. So, uh, and we, we've got, let's see, right here, at, we've got about 10 more minutes so we can kind of, we can dive deeply into any of the bits and pieces if we want. We've got all the code, all the samples right here. So it kind of depends on what you guys want to talk about at this point. We want to leave enough time to really dig in deep. <laughs> Pain points. Um, I don't know, you want to go? I got, I got some ideas. Well, well right now this is brand new. Sure. So uh, we were, we've been using Vagrant for many months, but this Puppet uh, configuration is new. And the next thing that I'd like to do is to integrate our Puppet manifest we use for Vagrant with the Puppet manifest we use for production. Um, Puppet or Vagrant supports running Puppet with a, a Puppet master. Uh, but there's some sticky issues with uh, signing your, your SSL keys or your certificates and connecting to a puppet master that's going to send a magical code to your vagrant box. Uh, so we haven't, we haven't tackled that issue yet. But that, that, I think that would be ideal if we mm -hmm. have exactly the same manifests running on our vagrant boxes and on production. And they're going to stay in sync. Especially if we can take advantage of, you know, puppet environments and things like that, so we can actually flag something as a dev vagrant box versus a production mm -hmm. box or something yeah. like that. And there's, there's a factor in there uh, mm -hmm. in the vagrant file to specify it's vagrant, so we can have conditions inside our manifests. So we've got that going, but these manifests in the repository only ever run on these boxes, so they're kind of meaningless. Yeah, and I think a couple of pain points that I've discovered. One, um, we ended up dis disabling the pair module. Um, because it was painfully slow on boot. Um, initial boot took like 10 minutes, um, and the vast majority of it was pair. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out why that's behaving the way it is. We disabled it for this currently because it, we're not actually, for, any, for this base one, we're not actually installing anything that pair needs, or that needs pair. So we pulled it out. For some of the Drupal stuff, because Drush gets installed via pair and things like that, we'll need to have it, so that's a pain point we need to work through. Um, and in general, um, Switching over to Puppet from the, from the custom shell scripts we were using slowed the boot down a bit because Puppet's a little bit slower than just a shell script saying install these packages, you're done. Um, so finding ways to streamline that and clean that up would be nice. Um, but that's a pretty minor pain point because the boot plenty fast at this point. So you had a question here? Um, so you're talking about what the staging and prod servers look like as far as managing those? Yes. Um, so we are currently in the process of rolling that out, and it's kind of like every time we phase out an old server, we bring up a new one that is under puppet management. Um, right now I'm doing very minimal management of that. Mostly it's just managing SSH keys and users and um, SSH configs. 
um, and some basic, you know, make sure Apache is installed and PHP is installed and things like that for the projects. Um, one of the things we're doing, hopefully, is because we've done this for the Vagrant stuff, now taking a lot of these configs that we've done for this and then rolling them, like Evan said, back into our production and propen environment, so we're actually pushing the same configs to the production servers. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a sysadmin by nature, and so, of course, I'm going to very slowly on that one because I don't want to blow stuff up, especially on production systems. Um, but that's kind of the roadmap, and that's where we're headed. So I don't have a whole lot to show you on that yet. I'm getting there, though. Yeah, Mike? Yes. Have you done anything with other languages? Um, we have not yet. There's no reason we can't. I actually I did set up a Vagrant box oh, see. similar to this for uh, Chili Project. Uh, pretty easy, uh, and much better than having than like having a mixed server, which is the way I used to do it, where they had PHP and four versions of Ruby on it. <laughs> <laughs> I just get confused. So it feels it feels good to be able to have a box that just has Ruby on it and has exactly the versions I need. Yeah. I was gonna reiterate on the pain points of Vagrant right now. For me, I, I've been using Vagrant for the last couple of years. The biggest has pain, pain point for me is managing and creating base boxes, which is the base machine you boot up. Mm -hmm. And so like, I've had a couple of environments where it's nice to have everything kind of pre-installed, so I don't have to install everything every time I boot it up. And um, creating a base box. Is Yeah, I would I'd agree with that. VWE is kind of a, a puzzle. It, it's, mag it's black magic in some cases. <laughs> the nice thing about doing a, a custom base box, though, is that you can significantly streamline the amount of work you have to ha amount of work Puppet has to do. Because if you already have all the stuff pre-installed, all Puppet has to do is verify that it's the right version, and that, you know, or if it needs to do an update or something like that. So. Um, you know, periodically having an, uh, an updated base box is not necessarily a bad idea, which is why we went with the custom base boxes. It has a lot of the stuff we need pre-installed so that it doesn't have to, the first time you boot the box, suck down 200 gigs worth of, <laughs> you know, packages to install. I'm not sure. If VirtualBox does, then you could you could wrangle your vagrant file to do that for you. I've okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. If you if you have oh, a question, I'm sorry. You ask him about it. Yeah. The question was, uh, can you do <laughs> pixie booting? Um, I. I mean, for the most part, you know, we st um, part of it is because once you have that base box, um, and it's stored once locally on your machine, um, it, I I. I I'm not sure I see much of benefit to doing a Pixie boot at that point. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about creating the initial base box, mm -hmm. based on the Oh, I see. It's sort of rather modified for this uh, custom environment. Okay. If I want to do yeah. testing, I need to do it via Moodle. Right. Mm -hmm. That's well, an interesting question. Yeah. If VirtualBox supports Pixie boot, uh, then. Cool. It, it seems like it would. Uh, all VWE does is boot a virtual box and then send keystrokes to it to run the installer. Um, so if you can do that with like your standard CentOS kickstart installer, you can do that with Pixie Boot, I'm sure. Um, it's a good, the good question is whether anyone else has done that before. And I don't know. I bypass the whole Pixie Booting stuff when I just incorporate the kickstart file or pre-seed environment into the VWE setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To fit within the constraints of what VV does. Cool. Okay. So we have uh, about four more minutes. Um, <coughs> let's see. We we actually do have, uh, and, and these slides will all be posted. Um, we can we can talk through stuff. Um, so some of the stuff that we're doing in the Vagrant file, um, basically it, it defines what the uh, VM settings are. You know how much RAM, how many CPUs it has, things like that. That's all tweakable inside the Vagrant file. Um, 
because we're using Gitalite for our um, uh, centralized storage of our Git repos, um, we're using we're making sure to pass that username on through and the, and the user's keys through to the virtual box so that if you have to do something like um, although for the most part we don't have to do that anymore but for things like um, doing SQL syncs um, it, you'll need to be able to SSH from inside the virtual box as you to some other machine so we're doing playing around you know setting the username in um, the SSH config carrying the keys over things like that um, I, I say a question there. Not that I can think of. Yeah. Good question. Um, and then last thing is we have a couple of things. I guess I can show that setup script real quick, but it, which is pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot there right now. <laughs> we used to have a whole lot more in here because there used to be a whole bunch of post install stuff. But right now, all it really does is just make sure that there's the database is created on boot, and if it isn't, it creates it. Um, but the idea is you can do both pre and post um, scripts. So if there's stuff that doesn't fit well into Puppet that you want to do, um, you know, you just stuff it into um, stuff it into either the pre and post scripts if you need them. Yeah. Right now, there's no good reason for us to have this because it, yeah. uh, it's easy to add this into a, a Puppet rule. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's there if, if I, it might be easier for you to write. Uh, six lines of shell script to do what you want than to learn Puppet if you don't know it already. And, and as Evan said, we originally, when I first built this, because let's say I'm a sysadmin, so I live in Bash, um, and I, I knew I wanted to go to Puppet eventually, but I wanted to get a working environment to r roll it out with our devs to try it out to make sure this workflow actually worked for them. And so it's like rather than investing all the time to actually puppetize this whole thing, I, we originally actually did it with um, some pre and post install scripts and it was all in Bash. And then Evan um, did a lot of the heavy lifting into, and just ripping out piece by piece all those um, shell scripts and turning them into puppet scripts and the puppet modules. Um, yeah, that, that's, this is all. Um, all this stuff is available on the GitHub repo. Where are we? Lost it. There it is. So um, everything's in here. All the puppet manifests, all the uh, configs, all that sort of stuff. So, um, and you know, by all means, you know, open an issue if something's hard to use. Pull request if you would like something to work differently. Um, you know, this is entirely an open source project. I realized last night as I was going through what we were going to talk about today, I never bothered putting a license on this, but I'm assuming we're going to throw something really open on it because I don't really care. I just want people to use it. <laughs> you know, MIT or Apache or something probably. Um, so we're out of time. So thanks for coming, everybody. I'll be around. <laughs>